In this video, we are going to review the SAT practice test number 10. And this test, as well as tests 1 through 9, are available on the College Board website. I'm going to review the No Calculator section of the math. You could see here that this icon with the X through it indicates that there's no calculator allowed. Now you'll be provided with a set of reference formulas and my advice folks is that you go ahead and memorize all of these ahead of time so you're not moving back and forth and taking time during your test. The first few formulas should be very familiar to you. Here these special right triangles, very important to know these, there's usually one or two questions involving these special triangles on the test. And I did an entire video looking at both the 30-60-90 and the 45-45-90 triangles. And I think that you really should be facile with the, both of these triangles before the exam. Moving down here, we have three-dimensional figures. And notice all the formulas involve volume. When you look at these figures, basically it's the area of the base taken through a given height. So if you look at this rectangular prism, it has a rectangular base, so the area of that is going to be length times width, and then you multiply it by the height. Similarly here with this cylinder, the area of this circular base is pi r squared, and it's raised through a given height. Here, this is a sphere you really just have to memorize that. And the way I remember these two is that this is just a circular cylinder. Same formula, except it's one-third because it comes to a point. This would be a rectangular prism, but because it comes to a point, it, you take one-third. So in other words, this cone is one-third of that cylinder, and this pyramid is one-third of that rectangular prism. Let's move on to the test and let's get to the first question. This is a routine algebra question. And rather than go ahead and write minus z here and minus z here and then minus one, minus one, I think it's quicker to move things to the opposite side of the equal sign in your head and then just change the sign. So as I look at this problem, I would take this z, move it to the other side of the equal sign, make it minus z, and I would say to myself, 2z minus z equals z. And then I would move this plus 1 to the opposite side of the equal sign, change the sign to negative 1, and therefore the answer would be b. Okay, moving on to the second one. And ladies and gentlemen, I suggest that with this video, uh, as well as any math video, that you go ahead and try the problems on your own first. Go ahead and pause the video. I think you'll get much more out of the video. Okay, so here we have a television with a price of 300 purchased with an initial payment of 60. Whenever you see the term initial payment or initial cost, this payment or this amount will stand alone it will not have a variable attached to it. It's a one-time payment. So looking at your answers, you know that here in choice D, 60 has a variable associated with it. Therefore, it is not the choice. Let's keep going. Initial payment of 60 and weekly payments of 30. Now, contrary to what we just discussed, if you see a phrase like weekly payments, monthly payments, yearly payments, yearly interest, that's going to have a variable associated with it. So here our only variable is W for weekly payments. Therefore that $30 and that W are going to be linked. So in this case we are looking for a total of $300 has to be achieved. They're all set equal to 300. We have initial payment of 60 plus $30 per week. That's choice C. 
Okay, let's move on now to the third problem. Over here. Okay. Now, folks, whenever you see a table like this with a weight, charge, dollar cost, these should be considered X and Y values. So I want you to think about this as there's a line drawn here and you have X values on this side and Y values on the other. So each of these are a coordinate. Okay. Here's your X value, here's your Y value. When you see this, there is a linear relationship between the shipping charge and the weight of the merchandise. This phrase, linear relationship, by definition, that means you're dealing with a line. And what is the equation of a line? Y equals MX plus B. So what they want you to do is look at this data and put this information into the equation of a line. Look at this. All these answers are in y equals mx plus b format. Whenever you are dealing with y equals mx plus b, which is going to be very frequently on this test, you are going to rewrite the y and the x, and you must find the slope, which is m, and b, which is the y-intercept. Okay, how do we do that? The way we find a slope when we're given points on a line and nothing else is we do change in y versus change in x. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the change in y over the change in x. Now we don't have to use these two points because the definition of a line is that it has a constant slope. You can do the first point and the last point and look at the differences between them. But this, to me, looks like the easiest way to go. The numbers are small, etc. So what we're going to do is we are going to put 21.89 minus 16.94 over 10 minus 5. And that is the change in y over the change in x. And that's going to be our slope. And I went ahead and did that ahead of time. And when you do that, you get 4.95 over 5 or 0.99. Okay, so our slope is going to be 0.99 over here. Okay, now we need to find our y-intercept. When you're given the slope, or when you achieve the slope or calculate the slope like we just did and you're looking for the y-intercept you're allowed to plug in any point on the line for x and y and then figure out what b is so what you would do here is you would take any of these points so for example x equals 5 and y equals 16.94 okay now at this point, I want to use a little bit of SAT gamesmanship. Rather than deal with 5 times 0.99 equals to 16.94, if you look at your answers here, you know that it's either going to be A or B, because these are the only two that have 0.99 as your slope. One has 0 as the y-intercept, plus 0. One has plus 11.99. Rather than deal with these difficult numbers, let me go ahead and cross these out. Rather than deal with these two difficult numbers, what I'm going to do is, rather than deal with 0.99x, I'm going to pretend that that's y equals 1x plus b. And rather than deal with 5 and 7 and 16.94, I'm going to pretend this is 5 and 17. I think that these two are different enough that I can get away with this rounding when I do my tabulations. Okay, so let's do that. Now with the fact that we have rounded off a little bit, let's now plug in our values for x and y. So we're going to get 17, plugging in these numbers, 
17 equals 1 times 5 plus b, or 17 equals 5 plus b, or b equals 12. That means this is our answer. Okay, let's go down now here to number 4. Okay, here at number 4, they're basically asking you to read this graph and interpret it. Okay, this is a graph in the xy plane. The height is in feet, h of x, h of x, g of x, uh, of course, f of x, that's always the y axis. Okay, so over here is going to be the height in feet. And along this side is going to be the base diameter of the in feet of the cylinder. How much greater is the height of the column that has a base diameter of 5 versus that of 2? So what we do is we go to our graph. We input base of 5. We go up to our graph. We output where the y value is going to be 35. And they want us to compare that to the value or the height when the base is 2. So here's our input. We go to the graph to find our output, 14. So we're comparing 35 versus 14. Therefore, there's a 21-foot differential. Let's go to the next one. Let's see, that was number four. Let's go down to number five. Okay. Folks, whenever you simplify a radical, the key to this is to look for perfect squares within the radical. Then you give each perfect square its own radical. Let me demonstrate that with a, an example unrelated to this. Suppose you're asked to simplify that radical. Are there any perfect squares located in the number 20? The answer is yes, namely 4. Now what you do is you give 4 its own radical sign. You keep 5 as is. You know the square root of 4 is 2. Therefore, this becomes the square root of 5, 2 square root of 5 as the simplification. Always look for perfect squares. Let me do another example. If you're asked to simplify the square root of 75, hidden in 75 is the perfect square 25. You give 25 its own radical, you keep square root of 3 as is, this you know to be 5, and 5 root 3 would be your final simplification of the square root of 25, of 75, excuse me. Okay, so let's look at what we have here. Do we have any perfect squares in this particular radical? The answer is yes, we have two perfect squares. So I'm going to give each of those perfect squares its own radical. We know the square root of 9 to be 3, and we know the square root of x squared. Whenever you take the square root of something squared, you just remove the radical sign and remove the exponent of 2, so that becomes 3x. Therefore, your answer to this problem is going to be a. Okay. Let's go here. The graph of y equals f of x is shown in this plane. What is the value of f of 0? Okay, so y equals f of x, right here. So here's your y-axis, here's your x-axis. If you were to input x equals negative 4, you would go to the graph and find the output. So that would be f of negative 4. Here, they're asking for f of 0. You pattern match. Okay. 
So if you go to zero, okay, let's use a different color. If you go to zero, and you input x equals zero, you go to the graph, what is f of zero? What is the y value when the x value is zero? Well, by definition, that's going to be the y-intercept. So the answer is going to be 4 or d. Okay, number 8. It's important to recognize that when you have a straight line, and look, they tell you that's a line with that designation. So AD is a line. By definition, the distance covered in terms of degrees from one part of the line to the other is, by definition, 180 degrees. The fact that we have this little symbol right there, that means this distance is 90 degrees. So the distance left in the region of all these variables from here to here in red has to be 90. All right, so let's get rid of all this. And recognize, again, that this distance is 90 degrees. So we have x plus 2x plus 2x. That's going to be a total of 5x equals 90 degrees. And when you solve for x by dividing by 5, you get x equals 18. Now look how they tried to trick us here. First choice is 18. So you're so tempted to go ahead and enter A on your score sheet. But look, they want 3x. So they want you to multiply this by 3. So the final answer is going to be 54. Okay, number nine is right next door. Which of the following line, which of the following is the equation of this line? I like for my students to learn intuition of lines. So when you look at this line, as you move on the x-axis from left to right, the graph goes down. That means that's a negative slope. Therefore, any of the answers that apply to this line have to have a negative slope. As mentioned previously, when we're dealing with lines, y equals mx plus b is going to come into the play. So what we need to do is we need to find equations that have a negative number associated with the slope. Also, if you notice here, all the coefficients on all the answers are 1. And that makes sense because this is a 45 degree angle. It's not steep, in which case the absolute value of the coefficient would be greater than 1. It's not flat, in which case the absolute value of the coefficient with the x would be less than 1, a fraction. It's perfect. It's 45 degrees. Therefore, the coefficient is going to be 1, or the absolute value of the coefficient is going to be 1. So the question is, which of these can we cancel out? Can we cross off? Well, if you look at these two, C and D, and you move x to the opposite side and change the sign, you see that these two are going to have a slope of negative 1. So it's either going to be C or D. So let's get rid of these two. The next thing we want to find is b. Remember, when you deal with y equals mx plus b, you are going to rewrite the y and the x, and you are going to be responsible for finding the m and the b. We already know that the m is negative 1. The question is, what is the b? Once you get that b, you have your equation. Well, here, rather than giving us points in a table, they give us the graph. And there's your y-intercept, negative 4. Therefore, the equation of this line is going to be that, and that is C. Number 10. The graph is shown. 
Okay, notice the coefficient with the x squared term is greater than 1. That means the parabola is going to be relatively narrow. It's positive, which means it is upright. Again, learn the intuition of graphs. If the coefficient was 1 half instead of 2, you would have a flat graph like this, wide. That would be the coefficient of 1 half. Coefficient of 1 would be perfect. Not wide, not narrow, but perfect. Okay, let's get to back to this problem. If the graph crosses the y-axis at 0, k. Okay. Very important, folks, to understand that x equals 0 at the y-intercept. Not only here, but on any graph. Look, if I do a graph like this, there's your y-intercept. What's the x value at that y-intercept? It's 0. Okay, the coordinates of that y-intercept are going to be 0 something. Okay, we don't know what that is. Could be negative 4, negative 3. But anywhere on the y-axis, the x-coordinate is always 0. Look, if the x-coordinate was positive, it would be off the y-axis. If it was negative, the point would be off the y-axis. The only time it's on the y-axis is when x equals 0. Very important to recognize that. Okay. So we know that x equals 0. We're trying to find what is the y value when x equals 0. So what we're going to do, quite simply here, folks, is we're going to replace x with 0 in both of these terms. Whenever you have a coefficient of x, a coefficient with x, and you make x 0, that makes the entire term 0. Therefore, our y value when x equals 0 has to be 12. Choice D, right there. Next one. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to know the equation of a circle. So here is the generic equation of a circle. Just one of those things you have to memorize, just like the quadratic formula, Pythagorean theorem, Okay, I want you to notice something about this generic equation. Do you see how it has negatives in it? That means when you get to a real world equation, okay, what I'm going to do now is nothing to do with number 11. If you are given this, You see that negative in, in the generic equation? That means when you are finding the center, which is going to be hk, sorry, I advanced ahead by accident. I touch this side sometimes with my hand and I advance down. I apologize. So when you're given this real world equation, and you're asked to find the center, which is going to be hk. Because of that negative sign in the generic equation, you look at what's in the parentheses, you circle it, including its sign, and when you give your final answer, you flip the sign, you do the opposite. And that's due to that negative in the generic equation. Here, when you look at your real-world example, you circle the number and its sign, and as you bring it into your answer, you flip the sign. So this would be the center of that equation. Whenever you have a negative in the generic equation, you take the opposite of what you see. Now, compare and contrast what we just reviewed with this equation. 
That's the generic equation for the line, a line. If I gave you a real world equation that looked like this, and I asked you what was the slope, you would tell me positive three. And I asked you what was the y-intercept, you would tell me negative four. In other words, you would put a circle around this constant and you would present to me exactly what you see. Then you would put a circle in your mind around this constant and its sign and give me exactly what you see. And the reason is, folks, this generic equation has no negative signs in it, only positive signs. So if the generic equation has positive signs, you provide exactly what you see. The antithesis is an equation like this. You see positive 5, you circle it, and you give me the opposite when you get to your center. Okay, I apologize for that uh, digression. All right, so let's look at this scenario. The radius is 2, and we know that in the formula they have radius squared. So we know it has to be A or B. So let's cancel these. The only question is whether it's A or B. So if it was A, and we're trying to find the center, we would take what we see, and as we bring it out to present it as HK, we would flip the sign. So it would be 5. We would take this, and we would flip the sign. Therefore, equation A fits this description. A is your answer for number 11. Okay, let's look at number 12. Whenever you have the word similar triangle, that means the ratio of these sides are the same. In other words, there's some factor that takes you from this smaller triangle to this larger triangle. Darn it, did it again. I apologize, folks. Thank you for your patience. Super. Okay, I'll try not to let that happen again. Okay, in other words, there's some factor that's going to take you from this smaller triangle to that larger triangle. If the scale factor, for example, equals 2, then these numbers would be 24, 26, and 10. But notice, the ratios would be the same. So if I was looking at the ratio between this side and that side on the small triangle would be 5 over 12. And over here, it would be 10 over 24. Well, we know that these two fractions are of equal value. So anything to do with ratios on the two triangles are going to be the same. With that introduction, let's see what they're asking. triangles are similar, what is the value of cosine of E? Well, it's going to be the same as cosine of B. Cosine of B is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, right? The mnemonic, adjacent over hypotenuse. Here's your adjacent, here's your hypotenuse. So there's your answer. Okay, folks, we're going to stop here, and in my next video, uh, we will go ahead and um, pick up with problem number 13.